This is Douaninet Festival in Brittany, packed with over 600 boats and a quarter of a million people. We'll be going there later, but first I must earn my keep by working on the restoration of this 1950s racing sharpie. Now since we were last here, we've painted the top sides down a nice bright yellow, and we've turned her over, and I've fitted a pair of rubbing strakes all the way around. Now one of the problems was, is because we had to longboard it and fill and fare the whole hull, we did it with the rubbing strakes off. Now they're back on, there's a little line of paint between the two. So to make it look quite nice, and also to sort of seal up the deck edge nicely, what I decided to do was to route down between the two, taking half out of the rubbing strake and half out of the plywood, and then glue in a little spline of oak. Now if you look carefully, they've got a very slight taper on. I've put about 10 degrees of taper on, and the slot that I've cut in the boat is six millimetres, so the bottom of the spline here is about five millimetres. It's about six millimetres here, and right up here it's about seven. So if we've made the slot a bit too wide in some places, we can take some off the bottom and fit it down. I'm putting a point on one end, which looks far more traditional than the rounded end, which has been left by my modern router. Okay, wiggle it in, try and look after the little edges, which are quite delicate. a tiny bit wobbly, so, and it's hard down, so I'm going to take it out and take a bit more off the bottom to drop it further into the wedge to make the edges a bit tighter. There's a lot of this end because it's a bit slack to hit. That's good, that fits pretty well. So the next job is to grab the cramps on the other side that's now dry. Take this spline out, put the glue in, put it back on, cramp it in position. Right, now we're going to spread that around with a little stick to get it up the sides of the groove. Stop it getting away, we're going to just put little grips on there and some cramps on it every 12 inches because the foaming glue will try and expand and push that spline out again. So fairly quickly, because this is the rapid glue, we'll put a few of these on. Right, so that's that one done. So the next thing to do is to fit the back half and by the time we've fitted the back half, this glue will have gone off and we can use these cramps on the other end. Right, so it's quite easy to trim to length here because we've got a nice easy overlap. Now this saw is a Japanese pull saw. Now the Brits for years have used little tenon saws with a hard back and they cut on the push stroke. But the Japanese pull saw cuts on the pull stroke. And because it cuts on the pull stroke, it's very, very thin. Therefore, it doesn't need much effort to cut through the wood. And it's also very sharp. Right, that's ready to drop in. So whilst that glue is drying, I'm going to clean up the rest of the other side and see how that looks. And it would be quite tempting just to grab your electric sander and walk up and down with your eyes closed, but it looks so much better if you go onto a nice long straight piece of timber and some paper, you'll get a really much, much nicer finish. It will take a bit longer. But you won't have to go to the gym tonight. Also, the quality of finish will just go up that one extra little notch and it'll be well worth your while. So if you do want to give yourself a little treat and find out how it looks, you can grab a bit of white spirit and a rag and see what the end product's going to look like. It should be something like this. I think looks absolutely lovely. In summer, there are boat festivals all around the coast. Some are specific, like the Old Gaffers Festival in Yarmouth that we went to earlier in the summer. But many are local affairs like this village regatta in Didisham on the River Dart. 
If you get there early, you can usually enter into a race or two and have fun on the spur of the moment. At the other end of the scale is the Duanane Festival in Brittany. We're in Duanane. We're surrounded by craft of all shapes and sizes, completely manic here. Craft that have come from England, Wales, Scotland, Holland, Germany, and even France. Some have come by road, but most of them have come by water. It's a pilgrimage. It's a pilgrimage for everyone that loves wooden boats, traditional boats, and all things about the sea. I love it. The French government is very keen to preserve the country's maritime heritage, so it set up a project called One Boat for One Port, as Fisherman Didier explains. The story of all those boats, and that the boat on which we are, is um, a very vast operation. Who, you know, the government, the region, decided right. to rebuild all one version of each working boat in uh, each port. That means, uh, for instance, Douarnenez right. was langoustier, Audierne was fishing tuna, right. uh, another port was fishing some, something <clears throat> else. And they decided to rebuild a copy of each boat working since centuries right. to keep the memory of people and the sea. If only, if only Britain, hear that Britain, wake up and do the same thing before yes. it all goes. The Recouvrance was built for the port of Brest. She's a rebuild of a famous navy ship, an advice vessel which carried important notices or letters within the fleet. She's very fast and has about 50 crew. There were rumours of a stone boat at the festival. Actually, what it turned out to be was this leather vessel, which was actually used for carrying stone. It's sort of an early flat pack, I suppose. And this is the Conquelaise, another vessel from the One Boat for Each Port project, and built in 1987. She's based on a typical fishing boat from Concal in France, known as a Biscine. At the start of the 20th century, there were more than 100 of these boats with their distinctive lug rigs, working the seas off the north coast of France. Other boats range from those bought here by trailer to the world's largest sailing boat, the Sedov which probably wasn't. And these rowing boats are called gigs. They've been around for centuries. Now these are the Atlantic Challenge gigs. And the design of these gigs goes right back to the 18th century. They're very long, 38 feet long, very narrow, only seven feet wide, and they draw just 14 inches. So they're very, very fast. They've got 10 oarsmen, all pulling like mad. And they originally were used as naval cutters. So they were used for getting men and provisions ashore from the large mothership, for helping with manoeuvring, setting anchors, um, and also for some ceremonial purposes and displays of seamanship, which is what's going on today. And the whole thing has grown larger and larger, and now the UK are involved, there's some boats that have been built there, and they now race all over the world. It's interesting this boat we're looking at, it's got a very interesting stroke pattern. They're doing one big stroke and then having a rest but well, they seem to be keeping up with everybody else. Also, it's a slightly different boat. It looks much heavier than the other gigs. So th this is the finish line between that yacht there and this yacht here, between the two yellow boys. These guys are finished. There's the first three across here. The smaller one is doing ever so well. Just shows it doesn't matter how many men you've got, it's how hard you row. The boat that we were looking at earlier, doing the interesting stroke, is coming in about last. Three. God, I'm glad I wasn't running. It's much easier watching. Apart from the boats, festivals like this one in Duanane are about eating, drinking, and music from all over Europe. I just love wandering around and soaking it all up. And these smoked herring are delicious, cooked in the traditional way. And there are opportunities to have a go at boat building too. Here, festival goers are trying their hands at building a dugout canoe. 
Now there's quite a few interesting boats down here and there's a really interesting canoe. Now it looks to me as though it's actually a dugout canoe and then what they do is they light a fire in the middle where you can see it's been blackened and charred and they heat it up so the wood becomes so hot it becomes pliable. They then spread the two sides apart, put the two seats in to keep it apart and they end up with a lighter canoe and a wider canoe from a much narrower log. It's very clever. Amongst all this chaos, I joined the crew of the Cap Cezanne to experience life on board a 1920s tuna fishing boat. And like many of the other boats here, she is part of the government scheme of rebuilding a typical working boat in each port, and in fact 80 have been built in total. The Cap Cezanne originates in Audienne in Brittany, but was built in 1992. Is that one big? You see a boat like this, you need a lot of crew. Yeah, Wayne's always weighs about half a ton. Nick? Yeah? You see? Okay. Ali? Uh huh? We're putting up the topsail as well, which fills in the hole between the mast and the gaff of the sail, a bit like this boat going past here. You can see the small sail above the mainsail. Oh, did you? No, no. Oh, no. We need now some wind. These are different. I haven't seen these before. They're for holding up the uh, the rope. Different idea, different country. It's only 10 o'clock, but it's time for a beer already. Sounds good to me. <laughs> That's another bottle of wine. Always on the phone. <laughs> French seem to take things in a far more relaxed fashion. Yeah, just bobbing around quite happily. And I was thinking if I was a, here on my boat, being British, well, what should we be doing? Where should we be? Nick, look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a reproduction of the last boat of Surcouf. Surcouf was the very, very famous pirate. Oh, yeah. And he was, he, he came southern and southern of English. Really? And he's from Samalo. Right. It is the most important pirate of Samalo. Really? Yes. Yeah, and that's. Yeah. It did. Surcouf. Doctor Surcouf? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you the story of Surcouf. And that is a reproduction of his uh, last boat. Right. You yeah. have on blower, but we have Surcouf. Right. And Surcouf was very, very rich. And he, in uh, his house, the floor were made with um, gold, uh, gold, gold um, coin, oh, English. Yeah. No, perhaps I'm <laughs> joking. But they were made with gold coin. All, all the floor of his house was like. I that. think, I think, I think you're um, it's, and it's not, very it's, biased. No, and it is not. It is not a legend. It is true. I think that every country remembers all the good bits. <laughs> so all the, all the all the English museums have pictures of the yes, I know. Of the, of the, but we have the French being captured by the English, and the other way around, you know. Look at that. It's, it's a, a fine ship, yes, isn't it? It, it really is. is. It's it very is. stylish. Yes, it is. Stylish. And here's a sardine. That's a sardine fishing boat to you and me. And she may look old, but as you can see from her number, she was only built in 1993, and is yet another example of the one boat, one port project. Now you can see the huge differences in size between the old style fishing boat and the new one. It gives you an idea of the large capacity of these vessels, really capable of catching tons and tons of fish, which could be why there's not many left in the sea. Barely out of service, this was Didier's tuna fishing boat, which is now a floating, working museum. Donc le ton se perche avec ces deux grandes perches qui font 20. You know those big, big, big things? Yeah, the big what? boom. Yes, yeah, the big boom. Yeah. Was the the fishing uh, rod? Rod. 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 Yes. This is a big fishing rod. Yes, yes, exactly. And there is six lines. You can see oh, yes. where they are. Six yep. lines going from from this one. Mm -hmm. They were pulling them at 45 degrees, mm -hmm. and it was staying like that 
for all the trip. Right. And they were living that like that. Right. The trip. And with the, with the lines, and the lines were the, beside the sea. Donc sur chaque ligne, il y a un hameçon. C'est une particularité, l'hameçon à ton, c'est qu'il a deux crocs et qu'il n'y a pas d'ergot sur son hameçon. And the particularity of that hook is, well, it's in two pieces, but you have no... No barb. Harrows, yeah, know, a like, barb. Yes, mm. because, uh, because the, 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 as the, the boat is always moving, mm. once the fish is caught inside that, you cannot go away. Got it, because yeah, the boat's boat, doing yeah. four or five knots and that tune has had it. Yes. Uh, this is the cruise quarters, and up here is the engine room. Wow, look at that! What a superb engine room! This is a straight six, 160 horsepower Bedouin. It's the original engine that was fitted to the boat. And modern boats have much larger engines, maybe even twice the size. But because this one's not a trawler, that is, it's not towing a huge net behind it, it doesn't need that much power because it's just got a couple of lines out each side. We've got some clothes pegs here, probably for drying your undies. Can you imagine being in here, like full six, full seven, the whole thing's moving around, you come down, you've got to check the engine, check the oil, you've been at sea for two months, smell the fumes, oh. Back into the cruise quarters again, and this is the bunk, that's where you sleep, and behind it is storage for your personal belongings. Get yourself jammed in there, no chance of falling out. <coughs> no chance of losing your bacon and eggs either, there's fiddles on the table, and there's a little thing here for sticking your tea and coffee in so that doesn't slide all over the place when it's all rolling and crashing around. You just about reach up from the hatch, your food comes down from the galley, sit here, try and get it in your mouth before it slides off the plate. <laughs> At night, the boats slow down, and towering over everything are the masts of the world's biggest sailing ship, the Russian Sedov. The festival never seems to sleep, with live music all night, and if or when you get your head down, do as this man did, and get under canvas, and don't sleep on the beach. I did, and got eaten alive. Back home in dear old Blighty, it's upwards and onwards with a sharpie, which is almost finished. Now this is the starboard combing going in. I've spent quite a bit of time fitting it. It's quite tricky because as it goes in, you've got to sort of bend it into shape before it goes in. So you get that end in, pre-bend it. This just forms a really nice edging to the deck. It covers up all the half beams, gives you a nice backrest, and also protects the edge of the deck. Right, that's a good enough fit. So the next stage is to take it over to the bench, and I've got to shoot off this top edge so it's nice and flat and also put a little radius on by hand. And on the bottom edge, we're going to put a little feature, which is a little sort of a, a little beading, which we'll cut with a little tiny gadget, which I'll show you when we're over there. One of the lovely things about this piece of oak is it's English oak, and it was actually grown about 20 miles from here on, on Hailing Island. And... Uh, when I bought the tree, I counted all the rings, and it was 175 years old. These lovely little marks you've got here are called medullary rays, and they're the storage sacks that store energy in the tree for when it needs it, and it gives it this beautiful pattern. Now on the bottom edge, we're going to put a little beading. So I'll turn this over. So what we do is we make up a little, little beading tool, which is an old scrap of wood, a little stainless steel screw, and I'll show you what we do. This gives you two little cutting edges, the slot of the screw there, to cut into the timber. So you rest it on the timber like this, and just gently work it up and down until it makes a nice little groove. So once you've got the bottom part of the beading, which is that, take your little block plane, set nice and fine, and just take off this corner here, round that over. Then out with your sandpaper, finish that one off. A little bit of a sand in there. Uh. 
So there you have a really nice sort of period feature, a nice little beading, which is far more subtle than any router could cut. Now, because we're going to dowel these holes up with a little pellet of timber so the screw head is invisible, I'm cutting the counterbore with a forstner bit. Now, that's a, a clever little bit that cuts a really, really neat hole. Now, it's a bit slow putting these in with a normal screwdriver, and you could put them in with a, you know, a power driver or a cordless drill, but we're trying to preserve the edge of this dowel hole, so taking it nice and slow and being quite careful. Right, that's tight enough, so the next job is to dowel up one of those holes. So I've cut some oak dowels here. Now they come out of an offcut of this piece of timber, so they should match quite nicely. And what we're going to do is dip them into some varnish and then put them in the hole. And the reason we use varnish is because if we put them in glue, then some poor devil has to repair this and tries to pick them out. They'll make a real mess, but if you put them in varnish, they do their job really well. But when you want them to come out, you can give them a bit of a pick out with a sharp braddle and they come out really well. Let's get a bit of varnish. Let's get a little bit on there. Now when you go to put the dowel in, look which way the grain is. Line it up. Now push it in. And then with a really nice sharp paring chisel, give it a couple of whacks. Take that last bit, like that. After that, a bit of sandpaper. And you end up with a nice, smooth, almost invisible fastening. Anyway, it's about another two, four, five, 20, about another 40 to go. So I'll see you next week.